another one of our faculty candidates. Uh, and then I posted another one, I think it was sometime this week. Two years ago, the Air Force asked me to take on a different job, uh, which was not what I expected when I left uh, San Antonio in 2013. So I had the, uh, the honor and the opportunity to be the top ranking person in my career field uh, for the Air Force. So I'm a civil engineer officer. Uh, and uh, up until the time that I made one star, we'd never had a female one star general, much less a two star in charge of the, uh, in charge of the Air Force. And I attribute the opportunity to have the jobs and you know do well in those jobs to be able to be at that position to much of the education and the opportunity that I had here at Purdue. So I've been coming back to campus to talk to ROTC cadets pretty much since I graduated. I was over in the armory uh, speaking with some senior cadets this morning. Grissom looks great. This renovation is fantastic. I can tell you the armory looks exactly the same as it did in 1981 when I showed up in 85 when I graduated. In fact, the classroom I spoke in, I had classes in there as a, uh, a senior, and the only difference is the furniture. Uh, there's a little bit more paint on the wall, but other than that, it hasn't changed. This is gorgeous. So my hat's off to the IE school for making this happen. Hopefully you guys uh, like the new layout, and, and certainly I hope this helps the academic environment. But what the Air Force asked me to do was basically uh, break a lot, of, a, a lot of glass, turn over a lot of rice bowls. Um, the way we're structured, if, if you think of Purdue as a campus, well, its equivalent would be an Air Force base. And you need people to run and manage the facilities, do the security, provide the communications. You know, how, anybody live in the residence halls? Okay, so we have housing that we provide, both for families and for young airmen that are single. Uh, so it's very much equivalent to the director of facilities here. And then above that, if you can imagine, there's another layer of management before you get to the headquarters at the Pentagon. The Air Force said we need to uh, reduce the number of people at that intermediate level. So we're gonna have a merger and acquisition. And we're gonna take all the people who manage subsets of installations and we're gonna combine it into a single organization. So my job was to take assets away from three and four star generals, get them to like it, and put it into a single organization and stand it up from the ground up with a lot of people who don't like change. Uh, and you guys probably pretty well know change management and managing change is very, very difficult. So that's why I've unfortunately not had the time to be here, uh, but as I knew I was gonna be retiring, I felt I had committed to do this. I love coming back and talking to students, so um, I took advantage of being over in, in Dayton and drove over yesterday. So hopefully, some of you will find one nugget that you can remember out of this seminar. Uh, and uh, if you do that, then I will have succeeded. But just a couple of, of slides. It's not death by PowerPoint, it's all pictures. And then I hope we have some time at the end for some Q&A. So this was me in 1984, remember, 1980s? What was big in the 80s? Big hair. <laughs> so, not the best hairdo in the world, but it was in back in the 80s. Um, so when I came to Purdue, I had a ROTC scholarship and I was a computer science major. I took CS230, which was Pascal programming, and after half a semester, I said, oh my God, what was I thinking? Because it did not click. I mean, I struggled. I got a lot of help and I realized, no, I need to change my major. Well, to keep my scholarship, I had to pick a technical degree, math, physics, engineering. Didn't want to do physics or math, so I said, okay, let me sit through the engineering course and, and see what they offer. And each school came in, they told you, hey, here's what electricals do and aeronautical and so forth. And I distinctly remember the IE presentation talked about, you know, doing production and OR and, and different things like that. And then they got to a section and they talked about human factors engineering. And they showed a civilian employee and an Air Force captain at a human resources lab, I think it was the one that was in Phoenix at the time, doing cockpit design to make it easier for a pilot to fly the airplane. And I said, well, that's pretty darn cool. You know, I couldn't fly, my eyes were too bad, but I said, that, I, I like that. So I picked IE, and I concentrated in human factors engineering, and so when I got to be a senior, the Air Force has you fill out a dream sheet and you say what career field you'd like to go into. And I picked, of course, human factors engineer and behavioral scientist. And you had to pick three. 
well, I was a cadet commander. I said, well, why do I have to pick three? I should get my number one choice. I'm, I'm you know, at the top. And the tech sergeant that was in the detachment said, well, no, you got to pick three. I said, all right, what do you think I should put on there? And he said, well, put down civil engineering. I said, okay. So time marches on. I come in one day in the spring and they say, hey, your assignment came in. I go up and see the major who had my assignment sheet and it says, congratulations, you're going to go to Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma City and be a civil engineering officer. And I'm like, what? I, I'm an IE. What am I doing in civil engineering? And so I said, well, why don't I stay, get my master's, then I can do what I want. And, and the, the major said, no, 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 you need to go, go on active duty. This will be good for you. If you want to get a master's later, the Air Force will send you back, which they did. Um, and I keep in touch with him to this day. In fact, he attended my promotion ceremony to two star and pinned on uh, the second star because he was right. It was something I never expected. But my point to you is Mick Jagger was right. You never know. Sometimes you're going to be pouting like I was that I didn't get what I wanted. I thought, well, this is going to be horrible. You never know behind the door that just opened what awaits. So don't automatically dismiss it and say, well, gosh, my heart was set. I was going to work for Company X. Well, maybe Company X just went through a big downsizing, and they're not hiring right now. So what are your options? Your options are to, to keep an open mind and say, what else can I do? Or if there's another opportunity that your boss says, hey, I need somebody to take this on, it's a chance to do something different. I can't believe that I've had the opportunities that I've had. As was mentioned, I'm retiring after 31 years. Um, in the support career field, so we need civil engineers at every installation. So I've been all over the world. I've had 17 different assignments. I've moved 17 times in that 31 years. Uh, and it's been a fantastic opportunity. Other than my first assignment, I've pretty much volunteered uh, every place I've wanted to go. And it's just made a huge difference uh, in seeing different things, seeing different parts of the Air Force, different parts of the world. Because I like to tell people, you're filling up your toolkit. The more experiences you can have, the more that you can relate what you see and what you do. Um, I know engineers tend to be very linear in our thinking, uh, but I'm actually very much an associative thinker. So if I see a concept, if I see something, my mind is always racing to say, how can I relate this to this? Um, and it's the sum of all those experiences that I think help me be a better problem solver because I have more tools in the toolkit. So one of the assignments was actually a Pacific island. Uh, and again, it's not a very big island. Uh, and that is a great motto, not the end of the world, but you can see it from there. It was a great assignment. I had about 140 people that worked for me, and my job was to uh, basically run, if you can think of uh, all the people who maintain the facilities here at Purdue, plumbers, carpenters, electricians, uh, power production folks, all of those people worked for me. And when you're 1,500 miles from the mainland of Alaska, you got to be pretty self-sufficient. So one of the, the points that I want to highlight in my talk, so there's four of them, the first is the value of systems thinking and how important that is to problem solving. And you're getting a great degree to put that to use every day, whether you know it or not. So on the island, um, we operate in an 18 megawatt power plant, six big three megawatt generators. And if the radar that was kind of at the far end of the island, if that radar was uh, operating at full power, we needed three of the six generators online, and you had the, the other three as backup, because it was a pretty high priority mission that you didn't want to have fail. You also had to produce all your water, get rid of your garbage. So if you had three garbage cans in your room, if you could burn it, it went to the incinerator. If you could recycle it, we got one barge a year. You'd box it up, and you'd wait for the barge to come every May, and you'd ship it out. And your last resort was to send it to the landfill, which we also operated. So it was September of 1991. We had a communications team working on the runway around the airfield area, and they accidentally cut a power cable. So it took us about seven hours to restore power. And you think, you know, we were celebrating. All right, we got the power back on. 
What we didn't realize was in the bottom third of the island, so probably kind of where you see that one, I guess they told me I have a pointer up here, kind of that around that hangar up there was what was called the water gallery. It's where all the water from the northern end of the island flowed down, and that was our water source. So you had a couple of pumps, send the water to the top of the island where there was a treatment filtration plant, and then you distribute it out. We had had a leak earlier in the week, million gallon storage capacity, we were down about 100,000 gallons, and we needed 500,000 for firefighting. So when the power came back on, the pumps in the water gallery did not. So I said the first people that got out there were in World War II. Imagine pipes that were this big around, years and years of sediment and everything else collecting in the pipes, you probably had about that much capacity. A little seven horsepower and 15 horsepower motor, not enough to push water all the way back up the hill. So we actually evacuated people off the island. Again, in 1991, you didn't have, you know, kind of Amazon.com or other things to get spare parts out there. It took a week to get spare parts from lower 48 out there to get things fixed. So how does systems thinking come into this? Well, what we didn't realize, without those pumps having backup power, we had a critical point of vulnerability. We didn't look at the entirety of that operation to be able to ensure continuity of ops and make sure that the mission can continue to happen. I've had many cases in my career where there was a, a very small item, a very inexpensive item, that the, the owner of the mission didn't understand was their critical node. So you, you're going to have you know, nodal analysis. You're going to do all these different kind of cool things as an IE. And you're going to think, be trained to think from beginning to end. What we're trying to get folks to understand is that they have to look at whatever their job is, whatever their mission is. Right now, cyber is very big, not only in the nation, but also in the Department of Defense. And those cyber operations depend on power. And how many of those units that perform cyber operations know how long their uninterrupted un un power source lasts? And is that UPS tied to backup power? A few years ago in San Antonio as a commander, one of those units, we had a power outage. Again, took a little bit longer to fix. Well, turns out their ups tied to a critical command and control node gave out after two hours. Oops, it wasn't tied to backup power. But that mission owner didn't know that because they hadn't pulled that thread from the time they got the order to do something until they finished the mission. What does it take? I can't tell you how many times I've looked at problems from that standpoint while my counterparts are looking at it simply from their little silo. And that's where I think IEs bring such great value to any organization is the way you approach problems and the way you look at things. So keep that in mind, I think, as, as you look at opportunities, you're going to recognize things that maybe your counterparts uh, may not. So how many of you relish the thought of signing up for a class and you have a group project? Or you have to stand up here like I'm doing and, and give a speech? How many love that? How many introverts in the room? That's me. I am a big, big I. I hated group projects when I was here. I, I, I would be the writer. You know, if there was a group, hey, give me that. I like writing. We'll knock it out. But to get up and do a presentation, to me, was very, very challenging. I actually had to force myself uh, the first few years I was in the Air Force to volunteer to do things. I volunteered to be a reader at church so that I could get comfortable standing, looking at people, and I did that because you just came in and you could read. You know, you could read the scripture read, and that was easy. Um, if it's hard for you, if you think the thought of being up here talking is uh, frightening, find ways to get comfortable in the role. Part of what clicked for me is I had to tell myself that, okay, at the end of the day, I'm going to go home. I'm going to chill out. I just want to veg. But if my job is, okay, I'm in my commander mode, I'm in my speaking mode, you just play a role, and then I can do it. I mean, you can't see the butterflies in here, but they're there. Um, but you just have to get comfortable with it because you're going to have some innovative ideas. You're going to have a great novel new concept, but if you have trouble communicating it, it's going to stay with you, 
and it's not going to get the financial backing you need. It's not going to get your boss's attention. And the other thing I found is that it's much easier if you're just kind of speaking from the heart. Know your material. And once you know it, we're just having a conversation. Um, I struggled at the beginning because I wanted to get, because I, I like to write, I wanted my transitions to be perfect and I was wedded to my script and I was tied to my slides. Tell a story. A story is going to resonate and a story is going to be remembered. Email. Of course, I think this generation is almost beyond email now. There's texting, there's all these things that I'm not even sure I'm aware of. But it's how you communicate uh, in the government, in the corporate world. But what I found is it's so easy to talk past each other with email. Um, I'm going to talk about a book here in a minute, but think about this. Think about if you know we were trying to have a conversation about something, and you know you asked a question, and I assumed you had information about the Air Force. I might start using acronyms. I might start having uh, a lot of conversation. And, and then if you came back and asked a different question, I might get frustrated. And why is that? Because I have information in my head that if our words haven't communicated it, she's not on the same page as me. And more than anything, when I've seen difficulty in communication where it leads to frustration, it leads to you know problems being incorrectly solved, it's that we're not clear in how we communicate with each other. Um, so recognize that just because you send an email doesn't mean that the person on the other end actually received it and understood it. I mean, I remember in my, one of my human factors classes talking about the signal to noise ratio and how much noise gets in the way. Uh, that's certainly one area where there's a potential for a lot of noise to get in the conversation. Making your message stick. You've probably had many speakers, I would imagine, that came in and talked about an elevator speech. You know, it's your 30-second pitch. You've got your idea. How are you, how are you going to communicate that? Uh, when I was in Georgia as a commander uh, several years ago, I came across a book that I thought was, um, one, it's an easy read, and it's uh, pretty profound in the message it communicates. So how many of you have heard the urban legend that, you know, if you're out at Harry's or out at another bar and... You know, be careful, somebody might slip something in your drink and then you're gonna wake up in your bathtub filled with ice, missing a kidney. Anybody heard that one? Okay, there's a couple. I mean, I guess that's a, an older one. But why do you remember that? I would argue you remember it because you're like, well, that sounds a little far-fetched. So the authors of this book called Made to Stick said things like that stick with us because they're simple, unexpected, concrete, credible, emotional stories. It's simple, you can relate to it. Concrete, everybody, well, not everybody, but most of us have been to a bar, you've had a beverage, it could make sense. You know, the credibility, maybe not so much in this case, but it, it, it grabs at you, it makes you remember. And if you think about it, before we had written form, before we had writing, how did our ancestors communicate? They communicated with stories. Your work, your designs, the things that you're going to have an opportunity to do can be communicated in that way. So your customer, your boss, your client is going to have a good, may, a, a good way of remembering, hey, this guy gave me a pitch on this idea. And if you've got somebody that you're trying to get backing for your idea in terms of money, uh, it's going to make a difference. So the whole point here is although you're engineers or soon to be engineers, I would argue that some of the most important classes you're gonna take are those that train you in an ability to communicate. And it's a skill that you're gonna use over and over and over again. So if it's your strength, great, continue to work on it. If it's not, or if you have a, a weak spot, like for me, things were uncomfortable, definitely work on those. And, and the liberal arts major up here is, uh, is enjoying this, so. The other thing communication related that I'll share with you is particularly with all the electronic communication that we have, I can't tell you how much a simple handwritten note makes a difference to somebody. And, and just don't underestimate the power of you taking a couple of minutes, uh, somebody uh, helped you out at work or, or as a student, get some little note cards, jot a little note, 
it'll, it, it, it will amaze you. When I was a squadron commander, so kind of the first organizational size of a unit in the Air Force where you have somebody who's uh, the top person in charge. Anytime somebody did something that was uh, noteworthy or they graduated from a leadership school or something of that nature, I'd just jot them a handwritten note. And when I'd walk around the work centers, I would be surprised that the note from me was pinned to a bulletin board. And I was like, wow. I asked my chief that worked for me, I said, why, why are they pinning up notes? It's just from me. And he said, no, it's a note from the commander. You know, you're going to be in positions where you have an opportunity to say thanks. Hey, you helped me out. Thanks for, for doing what you did. It made a difference. Um, that's huge. And that's just a, a personal observation for me that um, handwritten stuff makes a huge impact. One of the other things I learned out on that island, uh, one of the folks that I worked for, um, we were having a conversation about something, and one day he said, you know, it's not the answer, it's the question. So the first part was systems thinking, the second part was communication. This is about the value of critical thinking. Um, asking the right question is oftentimes the most important thing that you can do as you're trying to frame a problem, as you're trying to think about, you know, what is it that we're here to do, um, and really listening when somebody's talking about what they need. Um, oftentimes in the Air Force, we have people say, well, you know, I want to do X or I need X. And when you really peel it back and try to understand, well, what's the real requirement? You get there by asking a series of questions and, and thinking critically about, well, they say they need this, but what's their outcome? What's the objective we're trying to achieve? And I think sometimes as you're doing your, your classes over the next couple of years and you have opportunities to do designs and different things, uh, think about the problem that you're trying to solve and think critically about it. I think you're gonna come up with better solutions and I think you're gonna come up with maybe perhaps a more effective or efficient way of doing things because you're asking the right kind of questions. Intellectual curiosity is absolutely essential. Uh, if you just look at something, hey, that's, that's neat, well, okay, you get a little bit of value out of that. But understanding how something works, why somebody put it in place, and how you're connecting dots, I think is a valuable skill to have. Wherever you go, bloom where you're planted. Uh, you may or may not have the opportunity to, again, go to that perfect job when you first get hired, uh, but this is now kind of the fourth area I wanted to talk to you about. So it's my observations of being somebody that's been in senior leadership positions for the last 15 years. So as I have new hires, new lieutenants come into my units, you know, what am I looking for? Well, one, by and large, folks that are just coming out of school, oh my God, are they eager. They are so excited about the opportunities they have that they want to go from being a brand new hire to being the person in charge in like 30 days. And you kind of have to say, well, you know, kind of let's slow down a little bit. Let's make sure we understand the basics and so forth. Or you have somebody that didn't, again, like I mentioned before, they didn't get that one job they wanted. So you kind of pout about it. And they miss an opportunity to make the most of the opportunity that they have. You can't always pick what your boss asked you to do, but as long as you're giving it your best, I guarantee your supervisors, the leaders in, in uh, your company or your organization, they're going to pay attention and they're going to recognize the talent and potential. And sometimes the opportunity is uh, kind of hidden. Uh, you may not think that somebody's evaluating you for your ability to make a presentation or to do other things, uh, but there could be a reason why somebody gave you a project or gave you a problem to solve. It's because they want to observe, they want to see your critical thinking. They want to see your problem solving skills. So do the best with what you have. And I, I have only seen good results uh, come from that. And it kind of ties into this um, second concept that I often tell people you need to, in whatever you do, sign your work with excellence. And there's kind of two components to it. The first is there's a lot of very um, menial work that sometimes you may be asked to do. I remember reading a story about an airman who was deployed over in Southwest Asia. 
And his job was to, in the uh, deployed uh, base in the tent city, he drove the truck that pumped the sewage out of the latrines every day. Did that for 90 days. But the story was actually about how people would kind of wait for him to come around every day because he just exuded enthusiasm and had this incredibly positive attitude. And he said, you know, it's not the most glamorous job, but you know, I'm gonna be the best guy driving the sewage pumper truck uh, that anybody's ever seen. That's kind of attitude that you look for. He's signing his work with excellence. I've had to be a project officer, you know, building notebooks, uh, you know, doing very menial things that you might think, well, hey, I, there's, I don't need to pay attention to detail on this. But people are noticing, and your attitude and your approach to that rubs off with folks. So whatever you're asked to do, you're putting your signature on it. And then the second component is, you know, I know in the, my time in the Air Force, I, it's probably in over a million times that I have put my signature on something. It could be that I'm signing and attesting that my travel voucher is correct. It could be that I'm evaluating the performance of people that work for me. It could be that I have been a uh, special court martial convening authority or general court martial convening authority, and I'm making decisions to send people to trial, or I'm making decisions to uphold a sentence uh, that will send them to Fort Leavenworth for 20 years. So it's a wide range. Every time I put my signature on something, it's representing me. It's representing my background, my values, my beliefs, uh, and what I stand for. And you may not think about that, but the point I make to people is don't give your signature away lightly. Because when I would look at things come up from people that worked for me, if I saw, you know, Captain Smith or Lieutenant Jones had signed something, it was the power of that person, in effect, standing before me. So it represents you. And if you're willing to sign just about anything, that you start to lose your credibility. You start to lose some of that which sets you apart um, if it doesn't reflect your best work and doesn't reflect what you believe. And then I'll kind of leave this quote up uh, as we transition into questions. Um, so I'm a big collector of quotes, so I love the quote board. Um, and this is probably my favorite that I have collected over the years. Um, and it is one that um, every time I've left an assignment, and certainly now that I'm about to end my career in the Air Force and look back on 31 years, um, it's kind of my yardstick for success. Because in the end, if you can say that in some way, shape, or form that your service has mattered, that you've, you counted, you stood for something, and you helped make a difference, you helped leave it better for the people who came behind you, then to me, that is a huge uh, measure of success. And so I leave that with you to think about as you go forward. You're going to have a great opportunity both in your time here at Purdue as well as when you leave and you graduate to matter, to count, and to make a difference. To come back here and give back, to come stand up here when you learn to love public speaking, and give back to the, the students. Um, Everywhere I've been, people give me a hard time because in my office I have the Purdue Shrine. I've got, you know, all kinds of Purdue uh, memorabilia, and I am a rabid Purdue fan. But I am incredibly proud of the education I got here. I think it's a fantastic uh, school. And I came here from Albuquerque. I had never been east of Clovis, New Mexico before I came out here. Back in those days, no internet. Um, you didn't, uh, you know, Google and, and do searches, and I didn't do any campus visits. So coming here sight unseen, uh, it was a, a great opportunity, a great experience, and uh, again, I, I envy you uh, because I think the curriculum has continued to advance, the school experience has continued to advance, uh, and you have no idea how marketable and how much in demand uh, Purdue IEs are. Uh, so I, I certainly wish you all the best, and I welcome questions either on what I covered or anything else that's uh, on your mind in the time that we have left. Um, throughout your travels, what was your favorite place? Okay, so his question was, uh, throughout my travels, where was my favorite place? 
Um, I got to spend a year and a half in Germany. I was at Spangdalem Air Base, which is by Trier, kind of in the Benelux area. Uh, and that was fantastic. Um, great uh, mission uh, there for the wing and just great opportunity. I, I didn't get to travel nearly enough because um, I, I deployed to Saudi Arabia for about 100 days during the year and a half I was there. Um, but the people were wonderful, the opportunity, the job I had. Um, but to be honest, I, I don't think I've had a bad assignment. Um, so I've been in Oklahoma, South Carolina, Alaska, Virginia, Germany, Alabama, the Pentagon, Arizona, DC, Alabama, Georgia, Illinois, Texas, DC, back in Texas. And they've all been great. Oh, good question. Um, so like I was telling the, uh, the Air Force uh, ROTC cadets this morning, I think ROTC has matured a lot uh, over the last 30 years that the cadets are getting more exposure to, you know, kind of life in the Air Force prior to graduation and they have different opportunities. Um, so while I felt prepared, there's just such a difference of going from being a college student to being uh, on active duty. Um, but I think I would echo some of the things I heard this morning when I asked the cadets what they liked the best. And some of them said it was a sense of confidence that they got. Uh, one young lady was uh, a nursing student and she's gonna go to San Antonio and, and work in uh, one of the largest military hospitals that we have. And she said people would come up to her and say, you know, wow, we always gravitate to you because you, you seem to, you know, take charge. And, and she said it's not that she's consciously taking charge, but it's just that she's had that, those opportunities and it's kind of been instilled in how she approaches what she does. Um, folks from the academy, um, you know, I think it's, it's a different experience. Um, sometimes I've had lieutenants that have come out of the academy and because now they're free, it's like, whew. You know, they kind of slack off a little bit because, hey, I'm not as uh, under such a regimented uh, routine as I used to have. Um, but I think those, whatever commissioning source you have, if you never forget that the backbone of any service is our enlisted corps, and you recognize that they have probably more to teach you than you could teach them, and, and you're humble and you want to learn from them, then I think uh, the commissioning source doesn't matter because those that get that, succeed. And if you struggle with it, even if you did ROTC, uh, then I think you have a harder time making the transition. But good luck to you. Uh, what's something that you think you picked up uh, in the service that helped you that uh, someone, a civilian, probably wouldn't get? Wow, that's an interesting question. Um, I think certainly as I have um, gone up in uh, higher positions and higher in rank, having the opportunity to engage with um, members of Congress and watching how the government works. So the military departments are part of the executive branch. So each year, um, DOD, like the other, you know, commerce and everybody else, has to put a budget together. So having positions where you watch that budget process and saw how there's always more requirements than there are resources. And then how that works through the executive branch and goes over to Congress. And then of course Congress gets a vote uh, on whether they like what the president submits or not. Um, that I think has given me an appreciation of one, we have a good system, but we also have a system where there are so many competing interests that if you try to fight against that instead of understand that it's there and how do I work with that uh, to make sure that we're advocating as best we can? Um, I think that's maybe a unique perspective. Um, in the time that I've been in, the, the uh, perception of the military I've seen change. You know, I didn't come in in the 70s, um, but those that had served in Vietnam or slightly after Vietnam certainly experienced when 
you know, I don't know if Purdue was this way, but a lot of college campuses, the ROTC students didn't wear their uniform. Um, now, if I travel in uniform, I mean, everybody is coming up to me saying, hey, thank you for your service. Um, it's very different. You know, some was related to 9-11. Uh, you know, the first Gulf War, I think, started kind of turning that perception of the military. Um, so I'm not sure I'm really answering your question, but um, so what, what made you ask the question? Is, did you have a sense that there's... I don't know, just kind of like what you were saying before of like asking questions. I try to kind of, I want to try to see things from a different perspective, either just in the general sense, in the workforce sense, or right. just in, like I, was, like I just said, of just seeing something differently and trying to use that to look through my own frame so I can kind of understand it a little better myself. Yeah, so um, I, I think, you know, depending on your point of view, Folks can look at, at government and say, wow, you know, there's waste, there's inefficiency, or uh, all kinds of things of that nature. I will tell you that the, uh, obviously the people in uniform are there as volunteers, but we have a huge number of civilian employees in the Department of Defense. They could be uh, wage grade employees, so they may be aircraft mechanics, they may be plumbers, electricians, like those that have worked for me. They're engineers. Um, their, the Air Force Research Lab has all kinds of guys that are actually literally rocket scientists, folks doing human factors engineers, engineering, uh, and things of that nature. And they are some of the most dedicated and passionate people that you're going to find. So this image that I think people have of, oh, well, you're just a government worker, you know, that's not an accurate image. And sometimes that's hard to get people to recognize that no, you know, we have a lot of folks that are really doing some great things, uh, I think, throughout all the government agencies. But like a civilian company, you're going to have some folks in government service that aren't your stellar employees. And then it's the, the, the difference is in the government, it's a little harder to, you know, you could say in a private company, hey, you're fired. Government, a little bit different. You got a process you got to go through. Um, but I think. Uh, Having a good understanding of how uh, the U.S. government works, local governments work, is a responsibility of every citizen. And sometimes I, as people come up and thank me for my service, you know, part of me wants to say, well, well, I always say thank you, I appreciate it, but you can really thank me by being a good citizen, by understanding how our government works, and go vote, be engaged, do all those kind of things that come with enjoying the benefits that we provide. But thank you for that question. So yeah, that's uh, a challenge. So my perspective may be a little bit different. Um, I'm single, but even then, you know, my family is spread around the world. Um, I was actually deployed for the first Gulf War. Um, my mom was diagnosed with a, a brain tumor right before I got deployed. And being the optimistic kid that I was, I said, well, she'll get better. And I probably should have said, you know, maybe that's not the right thing to do to go over to the United Arab Emirates uh, when uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait. And she ended up passing away uh, on Thanksgiving while I was gone. And that was really hard. Um, and there are families, there are folks that have worked for me that, you know, two military members married to each other. And so one goes one way and takes the kids. The other goes the other way and takes the dog. And they hope that at some point the Air Force gets them back together again. Uh, but the thing that I love the most about being in the Air Force and that I think I'm going to miss the most when I retire is a sense of family. Um, we have great programs to take care of military families, single members. Uh, but the sense of camaraderie that you have, um, it, you know, it's the old six degrees of Kevin Bacon. If I'm at an event, it's like, two degrees of separation if I run into somebody. I mean, um, we were chatting. Uh, you said it was your brother was an F-16 pilot? So my brother was an F-16 pilot. And chances are, I'm willing to bet that our brothers probably flew with each other or knew each other. And so if I meet somebody that flew F-16s, I generally ask them if they knew my brother. And you know, if they aren't too young or too old, 50, 60% of the time somebody says yes and you have an instant connection. 
And that to me is, is really the neat part. So when you are missing family, for me, brothers and sisters, uh, the Air Force family makes up for it. And that's huge. We've got time for one more. Uh, you talked for a second about change management. Uh-huh. So I was wondering how the, like, the structure and culture of your role has changed throughout like administrative change and how that's kind of like what lessons you've learned about navigating that, that sort of dynamic situation like gracefully and how we could take something from that when we're in situations where administration of our job changes or something like that? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so one thing that I did when uh, the Air Force Chief of Staff asked me to take this new job on, there was so much emotion and so much uh, misunderstanding about what it was we were trying to do that it's the power of personal engagement. So I spent a month and I went to uh, literally almost around the world and I met with the three or four star general in charge of every major command where we were taking some of their people. So I met with that senior leader, I met with their staff, and I listened um, to all the senior leaders. I said, for this organization, how do you define success? And they gave me great feedback. They said, you, this organization will have to be responsive. It'll never forget that the mission comes first. It'll have to have transparent processes. Because I now own money that they used to have. And I get to decide what buildings get fixed at what location, what runway gets fixed. So it was a great way to break the ice. And more than anything, it established their trust and confidence in me as the senior leader that they may not like everything I was going to do, but they understood and they trusted me when I said, hey, you know, we're not there yet, but here's where we're going. And I think in anything, building that relationship and establishing that trust is going to be key because you can break down so many barriers and get something done in a very short period of time. If you and I know each other, and if you say something, I can take it to the bank. I don't have to read a whole bunch of stuff. If you put your, your signature behind it, it's going to pay off.